I'll look at the certification from a slightly different lens for each of the four sessions. The vast majority of our time is the technical content, which is aligned 100% to Microsoft's published exam objectives. Finally, we'll spend the last few minutes of each session going over some review questions because after all, AZ-900 is a computer-based exam and we need to get into that flow of being evaluated on our skills in a computer-based testing format. Now then, if you're not familiar with Azure Fundamentals or on a larger scale, if you're not yet familiar with Microsoft certification and what they're doing with role-based certs, let me bring you up to speed really quickly. The role-based certifications are not just for Azure. Microsoft is gradually un unleashing, I guess, or releasing is probably the best term. Releasing these badge certifications aligned to different job roles. And Azure, as you probably know or have a good idea of, is such a broad subject, it can be difficult, nearly impossible to certify on everything. So as you see on the slide at the fundamentals level, what we're doing in this training course is preparing for Azure fundamentals. This is just as much of a certification as any associate or expert level badge. It's a great accomplishment for your career. And I submit, I had a lot of fun taking the actual test. I thought it was really well written and I felt a great sense of accomplishment after completing it. And I hope you will as well. You may or may not decide to go beyond the fundamentals into the associate level where we really get down into specific job roles. Azure Fundamentals is a little different from the rest of the Microsoft role-based certs because it's not specifically focused on say the administrator role or developer and so forth, but those are available. I'll take you out to the website in just a moment. There's a portfolio of like 20 something of these associate level badges for different aspects of Azure and other Microsoft platform products. At the expert level, for experienced professionals, there's the Solutions Architect Expert, which is really a blending of administrator and developer. There's DevOps Engineer, which is really a blending of administrator, developer, and architect. And it goes on from there. As far as the metadata of the AZ-900 exam, the thing that I want you to keep in mind here is, of course, it's a computer-based test. And also, if you have taken other Microsoft certification exams before, you'll find that fundamentals is a little bit different. You see in the second um, block, on the second from left block on this slide, the exam itself takes 60 minutes. Normally, the Azure exams, the associate and expert exams are two and a half hours. And what's that, 180 minutes? So. Um, this AZ-900 by definition is meant to be a less intense experience. It's testing your general foundational knowledge. And the, the third and fourth blocks you see on this screen where it talks about more than multiple choice questions and case studies, that's not really relevant for Azure Fundamentals. At the, all the other exams, the associate and experts, yes, you're gonna wind up seeing lots of different ways that Microsoft will test your knowledge. But for the fundamentals level, it is largely multiple choice based questions. All right. So we'll have more to say about that as we go through the course. This slide breaks down the exam objectives and I want you to look at the weights. Notice that understanding cloud concepts, what we're covering in session one here, is about 15 to 20 percent. So it's a little bit lighter in emphasis to say understanding core services, which is the heaviest domain. And I think that makes sense because that's where we actually tour the major platform services, virtual machines, websites, databases, this kind of stuff. You, need, you don't need to know how to deploy these services and configure them and troubleshoot them. You don't even need to know how to design solutions in Azure. You need to be able to recognize the major or most popular Azure products, and you need to be able to describe in general what they do. Then we have security, privacy, compliance, and trust and pricing and support that again are, are a little bit heavier emphasized than what we're doing in session one. And I think this is good because as an instructor, I like to bring my students into the shallower end of the content pool first so we get used to the water, so to speak, and then gradually we can get deeper and deeper. <clears throat> so without further ado, let's get into the session one material 
which is really not so much focused on Microsoft Azure in particular, but instead focused on what is the cloud? What is cloud computing? And then how does Azure fit into that ecosystem, right? So we'll start off with a bunch of vocabulary like you see on the screen here, things like high availability, scalability, and so on and so forth. You might think, well, Tim, yeah, is this really a vocab test, this AZ900? You know, I'm not going to call the whole exam an ex uh, a test, but you will, in fact, be required to know what all of the terms on your screen mean. So a cloud computing really is where you're renting compute power from somebody else, and you're running that compute power in another organization's data centers. In the case of Azure, you're renting compute from Microsoft, and you're deploying and running your applications in their data centers. And you know in general where those data centers are. We'll learn about regions in session two. But the idea is that you're, you've got high availability because Microsoft's cloud stretches all around the world. You can place your application in multiple locations. So if there's a failure in one, you're still up because you have another copy of your app running in another data center. You see what I mean? Scalability and elasticity both refer to the fact that your applications in Azure can, in many cases, automatically or dynamically resize Let's say you've got your company website running in Azure and you're running a big promotion next month and you expect a huge traffic spike. You don't have to worry about scrambling in your on-premises environment to buy or rent servers to handle that extra load or you don't have to talk to your internet service provider to try to increase your bandwidth. You can literally just with a couple clicks of the mouse configure your applications in Azure to auto scale out to accommodate bigger load and in when the load is over. Isn't that awesome? Fault tolerance and disaster recovery is similar to high availability. It's where, again, you, you've got redundancy. You've got multiple copies of your services in different locations in the world, and you can back them up and you can restore them and protect them against failures, okay? And then down, jumping down to the bottom, security is important. This is a huge question that most businesses will have when they're considering moving to the cloud, whether it's Amazon or Microsoft or Google or IBM or some other provider. It's like, okay, we're going to trust you, Microsoft. We're placing our confidential corporate data in your data centers. How well are you protecting it? And how much do I as a customer need to know about security? And that's an important question that will continue throughout our training. You might see a reference on your exam to what's called the economy of scale. The, all this means is that when a business like Microsoft has the resources they do, to be able to put data centers all over the globe, they can pass that savings on to you as a customer. I mean, think of how many servers are in a data center. Microsoft isn't too uh, open about the specifics of their data center for obvious reasons, for security reasons. But when they're able to go to, say, Dell and say, we need to buy 100,000 servers, I imagine they're going to get a little bit of a discount because that purchase is so huge. And so, like I said, Microsoft is then able to pass the savings on to us as customers and offer us competitive prices. Of course, one of the huge drivers to the cloud for us as a business is that we don't want to have to buy that hardware and maintain it in our on-premises environment. Why don't we just let Microsoft handle all of that infrastructure and we wind up saving all sorts of money, you see? So this economies of scale thing works both for the cloud provider whether it's Microsoft, Google, Amazon, or whoever, as well as for us, the consumer, the customer. Yet more vocabulary, but this is important. CapEx versus OpEx. This refers to, again, the, the how you're paying for your information technology infrastructure. CapEx is the old way of doing it. I say old. It's still <laughs> fully active in 2019, right? It, this refers to where you're making an upfront investment in infrastructure. Whether you're buying servers or leasing them, you've got that initial hit of spend. And then, of course, you've got the initial hit of provisioning data center space and paying employees to monitor the servers and this sort of thing. And also the end of this paragraph on the slide, value that reduces over time. You've got depreciation after you make the purchase. 
With the cloud, it works basically on an operational expenditure or OPEX payment model, where you're paying only for the cloud resources that you actually consume and you're normally billed once per month with Azure. You can be billed yearly if you do what's called an enterprise agreement or EA. But again, the idea is that with the cloud, public cloud, it's services on demand and you're paying only for what you use and it's a recurring billing cycle. It's operational expenditure. Yeah, or another way to say OPEX is consumption-based model. This is a good slide that sums that up as a matter of fact. More vocab. We'll come to the end of the tunnel shortly with the vocab and get into our demo, I promise. I, I know because I'm a student and a teacher that PowerPoint can be a little brain numbing at some point, but we need to cover this. This is really good foundational stuff, foundational vocabulary. IAS, PAS, and SAS, what do those mean? Well, I found in my work as a solutions architect, most of the clients I work with are immediately familiar with infrastructure as a service because this is what they have going on on premises, at least to some degree or another. IaaS refers to running virtual machines in the cloud. What's a virtual machine or a VM? A VM is where you take a physical computer and you represent it basically in software. It's I hope you're familiar with it to some degree or another, but I recognize you may not be because the Microsoft Azure Fundamentals exam is not 100% focused on IT professionals. You may be a pre-sales person or you may be a support desk person studying for this exam, so I want to make sure to sweep up those shavings as we go on. VMs allow you to save money because instead, if you need five servers, instead of having to buy five physical boxes, you can buy one and then use virtual machines to virtualize the other four and run them on the hardware host. It's a beautiful way to do computing. And so, like I said, if a business is already using virtual machines on premises, IaaS is immediately familiar. Oh, we can run VMs in the cloud? Cool. So it has an advantage as far as familiarity, but a disadvantage in terms of they're not very scalable. They're kind of, um, it, well, relatively inflexible, especially when we compare IaaS to PaaS or platform as a service. With platform as a service, you're giving Microsoft more control over the environment, but you're getting in return huge uh, scalability, high availability, this kind of stuff. The slide doesn't really do it justice so much, but um, the, again, a big question that businesses have when they're considering Azure is, well, we don't necessarily have to run our servers when we migrate them into Azure as virtual machines. Maybe we can use PaaS. In other words, we've got these database servers, these SQL servers or these MySQL physical boxes on-prem. We want to save money. We want to run them in the cloud. Instead of just uploading our virtual machines directly into Azure, maybe we can use a PaaS version like Azure SQL Database where they're hosting, Microsoft is hosting pretty much the whole environment and all you're having to do is work with the data and the database directly. You see what I mean? So PaaS takes care of all of the underlying hardware, all of the security patching and all of that, and allows you to focus really granularly on your application. It's a great convenience, but the trade-off with PaaS is just that, you get less control. If you need, or if your IT people need to have full control of the environment, in that case, let me come back, then the way you'd choose IaaS. The good news is that this is not an either-or proposition you may very likely have a mixture of IaaS and PaaS services in your cloud environment or in your hybrid environment if you're doing hybrid cloud with Azure. Okay, so this is a summary of IaaS and PaaS and it also brings software as a service or SaaS into the mix. SaaS is, I like to describe it as a finished application. I guarantee on your computer right now, you've probably got a dozen or more SaaS apps. A SaaS app is normally an app that is cloud-based, whether it's in Azure or another provider. Think of Dropbox, think of Microsoft OneDrive, think of Office 365 or Google Docs. All of those are finished apps that you just use as a customer. In the background, all of the infrastructure is running in the cloud provider, but you don't have to do patching or code updates. You're just working with the finished end application. 
And you know, you can do that in Azure all day long. In fact, I know plenty of businesses that make their living developing SaaS cloud apps that they sell to their customers, you see? So basically, if you look at the slide from top to bottom, you've got a, a continuum where IaaS, you control most of the environment and let Microsoft have a little bit of the control. PaaS, it's kind of half and half. And SaaS, the extreme is it's all hosted by the cloud provider and it's just essentially an end user application. And this is a good slide because it shows you that split between responsibility. This is also summed up as what's called the shared responsibility model in cloud computing where Microsoft is responsible for the physical infrastructure, their regions, their global regions, their data centers, their servers, and giving you the software environment in Azure, the Azure portal and all of the resources that you can deploy. And then you still as a customer have quite a bit of responsibility. Look at the IaaS column in this table. Notice that as a customer, you're responsible for network controls, identity, security. So I've seen businesses think that, well, if we upload our virtual machines and run them in Azure, we don't have to worry about securing them. That's done by Microsoft. That is a false statement. If your virtual machine gets compromised and all your data gets stolen, what Microsoft support is gonna say is, the security of your VMs is your responsibility with IaaS. You see what I mean? And the split gets a little more as you go to PaaS and SaaS. Microsoft will have more controls in place as you move to platform and security. In fact, one of the things I like to tell my um, consulting customers is chances are Microsoft can offer you more by way of security when you go from say IaaS to PaaS than what you can do in your on-premises environment. Quick example of that is let's say you're used to hosting your business websites on-premises and you're responsible for all of that security and threat intelligence. If you decide to use say Azure App Service to install, to deploy your web app in Azure in a PaaS platform, Microsoft has this um, intelligence engine called the Intelligence Security Graph or ISG. It uses machine learning and artificial intelligence that can just proactively notify you if it sees any traffic that Microsoft thinks might be suspicious. I mean, those kind of benefits are something that most businesses either are incapable of doing themselves or it would cost them lots and lots and lots of money to pay for that extra. All right, public, private, and hybrid cloud models, right? So Microsoft Azure is an example of a public cloud or a hosting provider, Google Cloud Platform, Amazon Web Services. It's called a public cloud because these companies make their cloud services available to the general public. Now that having been said in session two, when we learn more about regions, we're gonna learn that Microsoft has a few sovereign clouds that is totally separate collections of regions and data centers and servers for governments, China, Germany, US are three examples that I can think of. But uh, technically the, the majority of their business, I think comes in the public sector, public cloud. Now, only few businesses in the world are big enough and have enough money to be able to have a true private cloud. <clears throat> this is where a business can take advantage of that scalability and uh, elasticity and fault tolerance, those neat things we've been talking about with IaaS and PaaS and SaaS, but they own all of the infrastructure themselves. This is nice because they get the best of both worlds. They don't have to trust an external provider but it's fabulously expensive to do this. And only very few companies have the resources to be able to do a true private cloud. So to get the best of both worlds, especially for businesses that wanna keep some of their stuff on premises for security reasons, is to do a hybrid cloud where you're sharing or you're extending your on-premises environment into Azure and using some secure way. We're gonna learn about network connectivity options in session two into session three, okay? I've found in my experience that the hybrid cloud is the most common option because most businesses have on-premises environment. They're not gonna just throw their on-premises environment away. 
By contrast, startup businesses that don't already have investments in on-premises environments are a good candidate for the public cloud where you're doing everything in the cloud. And like I said, very few businesses are big enough to do a true private cloud. Okay, so let's get into this here. We're going to do a walkthrough of the Azure portal, among other things. Let me minimize my slide deck and take a look at our environment just to describe what you're seeing right now. You're seeing my desktop. Whoa, isn't that beautiful? <laughs> and it's got our environment for learning. Let's bring up my Edge browser here. And this is the Azure portal, what you're looking at. The Azure portal, whenever you see a reference to this, refers to the main web interface to interact with Microsoft Azure. The address that you should know is portal.azure.com. And you need to have a subscription or you need to at least be invited into a subscription to be able to access the portal. The first thing Microsoft will do is have you authenticate. Let me open a new in private window and go to portal.azure.com and boom, there you go, you see. So this is not a public website. Each company who owns their subscription can define which users can come into the portal. You can see who's currently logged in by looking in the upper right. I'm logged in with my account Tim at timw.info. The name of my organization is timw.info. Each user who comes into the portal can set up their shortcuts over here to suit their preferences. In fact, all of the stuff here, we can double left click the background to change the color. The idea is that you can customize this environment to suit your workflow and your business needs, however you wanna do it, right? So this is the Azure portal experience. Um, let me see, there's other ways to interact with Azure, of course, but I think for our purposes, we'll stick with a portal. Let me come back to the color theme that I'm most accustomed to, which is not this one, it's this one. Here we go. All right, now let's back up a couple steps because before we got to this Azure portal walkthrough, we were talking about the vocabulary and SaaS and IaaS and public cloud and private cloud. I wanna give you a couple supplemental learning resources besides this training that we're doing to maximize your AZ-900 Azure Fundamentals certification success. One of these, I'd like you to do a Google or Bing search or whatever your favorite search engine is and look for NIST definition of cloud computing, N-I-S-T. As far as the, the main definitions that I've been giving you, uh, some of those terms, elasticity and so forth, all of that comes from this white paper. In the US Department of Commerce, the NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, just happened to write the paper that really most people in the world agree fundamentally defines what cloud computing is. Let me see, it's not a particularly long doc and it was it's written in a pretty user-friendly way. Let me just do a control F and look for E elasticity. There we go, because there's one section here, section two, the NIST definition of cloud computing, where they talk about the essential characteristics. And like I said, you really wanna study this and make sure you understand these terms because the fundamentals exam during this section, this part on cloud computing terms, you will be required to know what this stuff means. So I'm, this isn't low impact info, this is high impact, just as high as anything else we're doing. So we've talked about rapid elasticity that you can on demand provision and release resources. We talked about the measured service that you pay only for what you use. Resource pooling refers to that economies of scale. Let me zoom in a little bit more. Where Microsoft has the resources where you've got a virtually unlimited amount of compute and disk space and network bandwidth and you can dial up or dial down to suit your budget and your compute need. And on-demand self-service is, is useful. It's services on demand, like I said. So those are characteristics. Then the white paper goes into those service models, software as a service, platform as a service. And then it goes into the deployment models, private, public, and hybrid are the three that we need to be concerned with. So again, that's called the NIST definition of cloud computing. And I strongly suggest if you like to read printouts, you print it out. I don't do printouts. I like to read everything in my e-reader or whatever. Do that. But you want to make sure to study this closely 
for your fundamental success. Another learning resource that I'm sure we'll reference a lot in this training is at Microsoft Learn. If you point your web browser to microsoft.com forward slash learn, they have a course in there called Azure Fundamentals that serves as a great supplement to this training that you're doing with me. Let's see. Uh, what can I say about this? Well, make sure that you sign in to Microsoft Learn using your Microsoft ID because you can actually track your progress and I think you can print a completion certificate. So I find that this is useful for students who want to gather continuing education credit with their employer, you know. So when you go to your annual performance review, you can document how you've uh, worked on your professional skills. But again, in the Azure Fundamentals Microsoft Learn course, look here. The first module is on the principles of cloud computing and it goes through all of the stuff we've been learning. So I want to make sure that you know about all this stuff because again, I'm a teacher and a learner and I understand that your learning style may be suited more for one way or another. I know that some students really learn by hearing. You're hearing my voice. Others learn by doing. You may have a web browser, a separate web browser up on your computer, and you're following along directly with what I'm doing. Others are more cerebral and more reading oriented, you see? So I'm trying to give you all of these different paths to follow, and I want you to pay attention and analyze yourself how you learn the best, because that'll improve your efficiency. Finally, before we get back into the portal, I want to make sure you know about the exam AZ900 certification page. Again, it's at Microsoft Learning, but just do a, a search engine search in your browser for exam AZ-900 and you'll come to this page. This is where you'll go, let me scroll down a little bit, to schedule the exam. Now, this figure is going to be in your regional currency. I'm in the US, so it's showing USD. And the schedule button, sure enough, will allow you to step through the exam scheduling process. Not only is Azure Fundamentals a much shorter exam than the associate or expert level tests, it's also significantly less expensive. In my currency, the associate and expert exams are 165 USD. The Azure Fundamentals, as you see, is 99. I think the reason why this is so is that, as I mentioned earlier, Azure Fundamentals is meant as an entry point into the Azure ecosystem as well as Azure certification. So Microsoft wants to lower the bar, the barrier of entry. This exam, you don't even have to be an IT professional to take benefit from. If any of your work, maybe if you work for a Microsoft partner that's looking at gaining the cloud solution provider competency and you need to skill up on Azure, even though you're more of a business person than an Azure person, welcome. This is where you should be. By contrast, if you're an IT professional with lots of experience with Windows Server and on-premises environment, but you need to skill up on cloud and you're not sure where to begin, welcome. This is a perfect entree. Also, as you see here, where I'll highlight with my mouse, Microsoft Learning is gradually localizing the exam in multiple languages. As of this recording, this class, it's available in English, Japanese, simplified Chinese, and Korean. The most important part of the exam page, in my opinion, is skilled, skills measured. And it's no coincidence that this training that you're undergoing with me has four sessions. And each of the sessions is named after these skills measured, what are called objective domains. So of course, now in session one, we're looking here under understand cloud concepts. And we've pretty much covered all of this by now. Once I finish with my Azure portal tour, I think we're even willing to dip into the second domain before the end of our first hour. And you know what? I'm happy to do that with you because as I mentioned, the second session material on core Azure services is quite a bit heavier than the other three. As you can see here, there's a lot more text, isn't there? All right. Okay, so let me get rid of my other tab so we can focus more into this Azure portal. And let me show you around. Over on the left, we've got the favorites bar. You can expand or contract this. If you find you want more screen real estate, as they say, you can bring that out. These shortcuts, like I said, are just gonna be the Azure services that you find that you interact with the most. And you see this all services button? This shows the entire catalog. 
and you can just search. Let's say that you've been doing work with containers. If you don't know what a container is, don't worry about it. We'll learn soon enough. And we're going to be working with Azure Container instances a lot. Instead of having to just click or search and try to find where that is, we can just highlight this little star and it'll show up down at the bottom of your favorites list. And then notice that when you hover over these, the little three dots there, see now my mouse pointer changed into a four headed arrow. You can reorder these. And if you wanna remove them, just come back to all services. It's a little bit annoying that you have to search for the service again, but you can remove the star and it drops off your list. Now, if you've come into the portal for the first time, it actually doesn't take you into what you're seeing here. I'm in what's called the dashboard view. This is the way the portal used to be. It used to be the only way to go. And this dashboard is cool because you can right click and choose edit and you can bring out these little widgets. They're called tiles, but I like to call them doodads or, <laughs> or, or widgets. And you can drag and drop informational items like clock, you can bring out help and support. You can bring out different aspects of your deployment. You might think, well, whoop de doo who cares about a clock? Let me remove this. Remove from dashboard. This can actually be really useful because if you're monitoring your services, you can bring out monitoring data and display it on your dashboard. So if you're worried about how many requests per minute your website is getting, you can plot that as a graph and show it here so whenever you're logged into the portal you can see it as a glance so dashboard can be awfully useful but home is what microsoft recently started defaulting the portal to uh, and as you see it's meant more for a beginner it gives you big old buttons here to the most common azure services big old buttons to microsoft learn as you see and then a list of recent resources that you've interacted with. That actually is a pretty good value, come to think of it. I normally, like I said, don't use dashboard, my, don't use the home myself, but I probably should because this recent list is pretty cool because I think you'll find once you get rolling with using Azure, you'll be trying to find specific resources that you might have been working with a day ago. See, this tracks last viewed four weeks ago, one month ago. And instead of having to use the global search up here, you might be able to get it from home. Create a resource is one way to deploy resources in Azure. When you click create a resource, it takes you to the Azure Marketplace. And this is where you have all of your templates. You know how in say the Microsoft Office applications you have templates? Let's say you need to do an announcement for your child's class at school and you volunteered, you were the lucky volunteer. So you open up Microsoft Word, let's say, and you do new and you can choose a template, a calendar template, an announcement template, similar kind of thing here in Azure. Depending on what you want to do, if you want to deploy a virtual machine, for instance, we've got under the compute category, all of these, or you can just click see all to see everything that's available. And the way Microsoft works nowadays is that Microsoft is really friendly with really competitors. Look here. It used to be inconceivable to think of running non-Windows operating systems in a Microsoft environment, but we've got native support for the Linux operating system. And we also have lots and lots of third-party partnerships here, Citrix and Cisco and Barracuda. All of this is to support businesses who are interested in running some or all of their infrastructure in Azure, but they think, well, wait a minute, we're not fully a Microsoft shop, so maybe we should go to Amazon Web Services. And what you're seeing here in the marketplace is, way not so fast. You're using Linux? Fine, you can run Linux here in Azure. You're not using Microsoft SQL Server, but you're using MySQL, let's say? Well, no problem. Let's do a search for MySQL. We've got lots of options for running MySQL. You see what I mean? It's a different world now with Microsoft. I love it. If you want to come back to the, the home of your portal, which would be either home or dashboard, you can click the Microsoft Azure icon in the upper left. I use this search all the time. I find it to be faster than, than messing around with the favorites list. Notice it says search resources, services, and docs. Shows you a history of what you've searched for recently, recent resources that you've found, 
if you know in general what you're looking for, like if I'm doing some security work and I want to look for network security groups, I can just start to type and either use the arrow key or my mouse to find the resource or the service that I'm looking for. And I want to show you also, you see other sections. These are Azure Marketplace templates that might be related, as well as documentation articles. So if we were working with network security groups, which we'll learn in more detail in session two what those are, you can jump right to the appropriate docs article right from the Azure, excuse me, right from the Azure portal. Isn't that awesome? And speaking of docs, although the Azure fundamentals is general knowledge and you don't have to actually deploy and do configuration or troubleshooting, I want you to be aware of the Azure Docs. You can get the, to the home page by going to docs.microsoft.com forward slash Azure. The Azure documentation is outstanding, I gotta say. Number one, it's open source. And what that means is that anybody, including you, yes, you, can contribute. So if you see um, something as simple as a typo, you can fix that yourself. Or if you see an example that's unclear, you can leave a comment and ask Microsoft to fix it. Or if you might have a clarification or an example that you want to add to the documentation article, you can do that. It's in some ways the Azure documentation is like Wikipedia or a wiki. Now, uh, anything you change is going to be vetted by Microsoft. So don't think that you can just go in and edit an Azure help article to deface it and say, use Amazon instead. And that won't get approved. But the fact that the Azure documentation is open source means that it's really up to date. And that's especially important with Azure because Azure changes every day, all right? So I want to make sure that the Azure documentation is on your list of, of uh, resources that you use in your Azure Fundamental Study and beyond. Let's see, over here I'm going to talk about Cloud Shell in just a second. This filter button allows you to, to get an easier view of your resources. You may have multiple subscriptions that you're a member of, like I do, but I don't want to, when I'm looking at virtual machines, for instance, I don't want to see a thousand VMs across all the subscriptions. I just want to see from the subscription or the subscriptions that I use most often. Notice that I've set my filter to my subscription called Pluralsight. I can change that really easily. Let me instead change the filter to only show my Microsoft Azure sponsorship, or maybe I only want to see by default two subscriptions. You see what I'm saying? And when you do that, notice that the view changes instantly over here. So this is this filter is just to make your environment easier to navigate. It can get overwhelming if you belong to multiple subscriptions and those subscriptions have lots of resources in them, you see. Also, you've got the notion of the directory. Now, multiple subscriptions can actually point to the same directory. What is a directory, Tim? A directory is Azure Active Directory or Azure AD, and it's where your identities are stored. It's where your user accounts are stored, see? So you can choose which directory or organization is your default, and then you can switch among directories here down at the bottom if you belong to multiples, which I do. Again, as you see, you can just click to select them. So the directory and subscription filter is more of use to people who belong to multiple subscriptions, multiple directories. And if you are part of a cloud solution provider organization, chances are very good that's relevant to you. This notification bell is where you go to get some news, but more importantly, when you're doing work in Azure, the work when it's in process will show up here and you can get details about it. This gear icon just allows you to customize metadata, your timeout, log me out when you're inactive for a certain number of minutes, that kind of stuff. Change your view and color scheme and that kind of stuff. This question mark is where you can file a support ticket with Microsoft. If you click help and support, it takes you to this view here. This can be really important because especially if you've purchased a support plan with Azure, this is where you're going to go to lodge or file support requests and also follow them through the resolution. Okay. This little smiley face is just where you can give the Azure product teams 
feedback and they do pay attention to your feedback by the way so you're not just sending your experience into the void the new microsoft you'll probably hear me refer to that a lot in this training when i say the new microsoft i'm basically talking about microsoft since satya nadella became chief executive officer we're talking about a microsoft that's much more inclusive and broad than it used to be including Microsoft product teams, that is the engineers who make these products, being really open to customer feedback and actually to have their work being driven by us, the customers. The user menu, as I say here, is where you can get to, to a degree, your user properties. But the main thing I use this for is, like I said, if I belong to multiple directories, I may have multiple user accounts. And it's cool that you can easily switch among those here in this list. Now, this list is just for me. If, um, I don't know, if another user named Jane logged in, she would have her list of multiple user accounts. I just want to stress that this is what's called a multi-tenant, multi-user interface. Multi-tenant, meaning that a single Azure Active Directory can have multiple users and multi-user, meaning that you could have all your IT people logged into portal.azure.com at once, and none of them are going to be necessarily stepping on each other's work unless they're actually trying to make changes to the same resource at the same time. You see what I mean? Okay, let's see here. Where, where do we want to go next in this tour? Well, there's one more user interface element, and that's the cloud shell. Remember I mentioned several minutes ago that the Azure portal is probably the most common way to interact with Azure services, but it's not the only. If you're uh, more of an IT person and you're into command line stuff, if you have an experience with Linux, Unix, for instance, you're probably command line heavy. If you're a Microsoft professional and you're into PowerShell, you're into command line automation. The value proposition of Cloud Shell is that it gives you really quick command line access to Azure. Normally, if you want to work with Azure PowerShell, you'll have to install Azure PowerShell. In fact, I'm probably going to be doing a lot of docs lookups as we go on. If you do an Azure install Azure PowerShell, look here. Install Azure PowerShell with PowerShell Get. And you've got a number of hits all going to Microsoft Docs. Well, the idea with Cloud Shell is what if you're on vacation and your spouse said you are not bringing your laptop? This is a family vacation. But you do have your iPad or your tablet and you get a high priority text message and only you can solve a problem. Well, how are you going to do that? You're thinking, oh, brother, I could do this with PowerShell in 10 seconds but I don't have access to my laptop. I don't have my Azure PowerShell. Not so fast. All you need is an internet connection. You can go to portal.azure.com, log in, and you can either do the work graphically or you can fire up the cloud shell. So here we're in a full command line environment where we can start Azure PowerShell, as you see that I just did right now. Notice that it's automatically authenticating us or logging us into Azure. If you know Azure PowerShell, you can start using the commands. Don't worry about the commands I'm using specifically. We don't need to know them for the purpose of Azure Fundamentals. Get AZVM if we want to see our virtual machines. And then you can go on and solve the problem. So like I said, the benefit is that it's super fast. And you know, it's a, it's a nice alternative to the graphical user interface. And like I said, you can get to this from wherever you are in the world. As a matter of fact, if you point your browser to shell.azure.com, you can bypass the Azure portal totally and just log in with your administrative credential and all you have here is the cloud shell. To that point, Microsoft Azure mobile apps. Microsoft makes mobile apps for Android and iOS. I'll just show you that, I'll point you to this video here. I use mine all the time. I use iPhone as my mobile device. And just the other day, I fired up the Azure mobile app. And believe it or not, you can get to Cloud Shell from your mobile phone on the mobile app. It's a little bit small. The text is a little bit small. But 
the graphical interface is really neat. I was able to do my work from my phone, from my doctor's office. I needed to stop a couple VMs. It's like, oh yeah, I better stop those. Boom, opened up my mobile app, tap, tap, and I'm done. It's very convenient. And like I said, the Azure mobile app's available for iOS as well as Android. You get the idea? Now, if you're not an IT professional, you're thinking, do I care about this? I submit yes, because you're learning Azure Fundamentals. <laughs> but technically, day to day, who's going to come in here and who's actually going to do work? By and large, it's going to be an IT professional. It's going to be administrators, systems administrators, network administrators. It's going to be security people, potentially. It's going to definitely be developers, application developers, database developers, anybody who's going to actually be interacting with the behind the scenes of these different services. You see, I keep coming back to the virtual machines blade and you see I have a couple of them running right here and you can read some of their metadata. So normally are your end users, your business desktop end users ever gonna need to come into the portal? Probably not, but I almost guarantee if you're hosting services in Azure, they'll be working with them. See this VM one? Maybe you've got your corporate intranet website running on VM1. All your employees care about is they open their browser, they go to portal.company.com, let's say, and behind the scenes, it makes a connection to VM1's web server and it displays and they do their work. They don't care. But your IT staff, of course, is very much concerned with the underlying environment and that would bring them here into Azure Portal. Got it? So... So that's the dealio with that. Let me come back to our exam AZ900 blueprint page again. In fact, let me see if I can remember in Edge how to bring out my favorites bar, because I want to show favorites bar always. I want to bookmark some pages so we can easily get to them. That's the AZ103 exam page. Let's bring this one out as a separate tab. Okay, yeah, I wanted to come back down just to make sure we haven't missed anything. I think we've covered the first piece, the cloud concepts, pretty well, and we've actually dipped a little bit into Azure services. I think what we'll do in our final 13, 12, 13 minutes of session one is take a look at Azure from more of a global standpoint. I had mentioned to you earlier that some of the reason why Microsoft gives you those cloud attributes, the cloud scale, the virtually unlimited compute and storage and all of that is because Microsoft has deployed these data centers across the entire globe. And that's certainly true. So let me come to another tab and look up the Azure regions page. Here it is right here. It's the first search result. Now, a region refers to an area of the world. No big surprise there. And as of today, as I'm teaching it's to you, it's mid-August 2019, it looks like there's 54 of these defined regions spread across 140 countries. And you can see a map down here below. And the text may be small on your screen, but the filled-in circle is a region that's fully online and available. The outline circle is a region that's not yet fully lit up. It, maybe it's under construction or it's gradually being built out. And then we have these little diamonds that reference what are called availability zones. So you can see in the continental US and Europe, in India to a degree, uh, and the East Asia it looks like we've got, and then there's some big gaps. I wish more of Africa, South America, Russia, Greenland, it looks like there's some, some gaps here, but the idea at least is to give coverage geographically. And what a business will do when they decide to use Azure is you'll want to choose the region or regions that are closest to the consumers of those services. Hopefully that makes sense. Why would you want to deploy? Let's say you're based in the Eastern US and you figure that you're going to use East US as your home region because that's where your business is based. But then you think, well, wait a minute, we are a manufacturer of a software as a service product and our customers are actually spread pretty much all over the world. How can we give our customers a better experience? Well, we can duplicate our Azure resources by placing copies of them in other regions to bring them 
the services closer to the customers. You see what I mean? So that's what I want you to think about. I want you to think of um, deploying your Azure services in multiple regions to put them closer to customers and give the customers the fastest connection to those data centers possible. And I also want you to think of deploying copies of your Azure resources in multiple regions as a way to do geographic fault tolerance. So we might have our primary infrastructure in the East US, but we might replicate it to West US so that if there's a failure, maybe on Microsoft's part, there's an Azure outage that knocks out the entire East US region for a period of time. We still have a copy of those services running in West US, so we should be good, right? That's the idea geographic fault tolerance. Now, each of these regions, the specific postal address of those data centers, Microsoft obviously protects for security reasons. They also, each data center is heavily protected. You can't get anywhere near it before you're stopped by security. Uh, even Microsoft employees and managers, many of them have never visited a data center. It's all for what's called operational security. Um, if you've ever heard of Mark Rosinovich, Mark Rosinovich, Azure Data Center Security. Mark Rosinovich is the chief technical officer of Azure, and he's pretty open about how the Azure Data Center architecture works, including from a security perspective. He keeps in mind not giving too many details because obviously it's operational security but he is pretty transparent, as transparent as he can be. So I'd like to suggest if you're interested, go to say YouTube and look up Mark Rosinovich where he talks about Azure Data Center architecture. It's very interesting and enlightening stuff. Now, back in this regions picture, these little diamonds represent something called availability zones. The idea here is that each region consists of multiple data centers. So in the Eastern US, Again, Microsoft isn't going to tell you the address of each of the data centers, but the idea is you can actually spread your resources like virtual machines, for instance. Let's go back to the portal for a second and go back to the virtual machines blade. Let's say instead of having just one web server running in East US 2, in order to make this more fault tolerant, we could clone VM1. Let's say VM2 is actually a clone of VM1. They both host the same web application or database or whatever it is that you're offering to your customers. You could put VM2, like I said, in a different region. Region and location are synonyms, by the way. But you may not want that. You may not need that level of redundancy. Instead, you might say, I want both of my copies, my replicas, to be in the same location or same region. Maybe your security people say they have to be. Maybe your security compliance is such that you have to stay in a particular region. In that case, you can use what are called availability zones. And basically, you're placing your VMs in separate data centers in the same region. <laughs> So you're able to protect against different kinds of failures. If one of your VMs goes offline, your web application or your database or whatever it is will still be online because you have at least one other copy running. Now you may be thinking, Tim, does Microsoft do all this for you? The answer to that is no, especially with, at, with infrastructure as a service, as I said. You have to do this. If these were going to be cloned virtual machines, you have to do that cloning yourself. You have to place them in the appropriate regions or availability zones yourself. That's not something Microsoft will do. Let me quickly show you. Let me go to add in virtual machine. And as you're filling in the form here to create a new virtual machine, of course, it's going to need a name. Let's say we want to do VM3. You place it in a region, in an Azure location, and you can just pick it from the list here. And then under availability options, it says by default, no infrastructure redundancy required. And then if you'd want to do an availability zone, you could choose it here. But notice in this example, it's grayed out. Why do you think it's grayed out? Well, that's because if we go back to that regions map, 
while every region is supposed to have more than one data center that are connected with really high speed redundant network links, not every region is set up as availability zones yet. So that's why you see only some regions have the little diamond. Of course, Microsoft's goal is to have availability zones available in every region. So if you needed to do that, if you needed to use availability zones, you'd have to choose a region that supports them. And I happen to know that East US or East US2 do support availability zones. So notice I can now say, yes, I'm gonna place VM3 in an availability zone in the East US, and they're just given numbers. So you would know VM1 might be in data center one, VM2 might be in data center two, and VM3 we could place in availability zone three. And again, the reason we do this is to provide levels of fault tolerance and high availability. I mean, things happen on Microsoft side. What if in availability zone one, there was a lightning strike that took out the data center? That would be a case where you'd be in trouble if all of your services were in that data center. But if you've got other replicas placed in other availability zones, you're online. Now, of course, the question, what if the entire region goes offline? In that case, the way to ward against that kind of fault is, as I said, to place your resource in a totally separate location or region. You got it? Does that make some semblance of sense, I hope? What else do I want to say about regions? Well, let's see. One thing is that, as I think you just saw with availability zone, not every product is available in every region. Let's see here. Let me try to choose one that's a little more specialized, like Azure Machine Learning Service. Looks like it's available in only 11 of 50 regions. So what I'm saying here is that in choosing your region for your resources, you wanna think about multiple things. You wanna think about whether you need geographic fault tolerance. You need to think about where your customers are and where you wanna place your resources as close as possible to them. You wanna think about availability zones, whether that's required. And you also wanna think about is what I need to deploy actually supported in such and so a region? You see, because it's not always the case, especially for newer Azure products, that they will be available. Something like VMs will be available globally in every region, but other ones that are newer, notice the table key down below. It says generally available means that it's available now. In preview means that it's in kind of beta mode and you're not supposed to use it in a production way until it becomes generally available. And future availability means that the product is not available in that region yet. And by the way, we're at azure.com here. The Microsoft people call their public web portal ACOM for short, but the azure.com site is where you can get, if we look across the top here, lots of good information that's relevant to our interests for Azure fundamentals. So, so far, just to quickly do a high level recap, I've told you that you need to bookmark the AZ900 page at Microsoft Learning. You need to bookmark Microsoft Learn, which was microsoft.com forward slash learn, and in particular, the Azure Fundamentals Learning Path. You need to bookmark portal.azure.com, and for some reason, actually creating a subscription is in session four, so we will get to that, but at the tail end of the course, curiously enough. But once you have a subscription, you'll want portal.azure.com. And then the Azure regions, you can just do a search for Azure regions and that'll take you into azure.com, the appropriate page that you're seeing here that we've been looking at. I think the final point I, I need to transmit to you about regions is the notion of sovereign regions. Um, by the way, this is a nice picture that shows the availability zone idea where you've got geographic regions that consist of multiple data centers, which could be availability zones. But I want to look at the sovereign regions. Huh, let me do a Google search for that. Azure um, Government Cloud. It's also called Government Cloud Computing. I had told you earlier that Microsoft Azure is a public cloud provider because 
they offer their services to the general public. And that regions page we were on a moment ago, those are all Azure cloud, Azure public cloud global regions. However, you should know that there's actually another whole collection of regions and data centers and availability zones that Microsoft maintains for certain governments. It's called Azure government or Azure sovereign cloud. I want to get a list. This is just showing the US government cloud, but I wanted to get a list of them all. Azure government cloud list. Huh. Should be easier to find than this, but at last check, and you're not going to be asked on your exam to name off the government clouds, but at last check, it was Germany, US, and China. These are sovereign clouds that the general public can't even see in the Azure portal. We're not going to ever see a government cloud region listed here, for instance. But if you are part of a government that uses the sovereign cloud, then you would use only those regions, those data centers, and those products. As you can imagine, it's extraordinarily expensive for Microsoft to build an entire cloud just for a single government. That's why there's only three of them. I'm sure that there'll be more as we go on in time. But anyway, we've reached the um, top of our first hour. So let's quickly do some review questions and we'll call it a day. Here we have Contoso deciding to consolidate their IT investments. They want to migrate their on-premises environment to the cloud and they want to minimize cost. You suggest that the servers should be migrated to a public cloud platform. The major benefit of the public cloud is, what do you think? Is it a free platform? Is it an open platform? Is it shared by multiple customers to minimize costs? Or is it all resources of a public cloud can be used by anyone across the globe? These require quite a bit of reading. I have to say that the actual exam is going to be less verbose than this. As I said, the public cloud is a multi-user environment. Next, Contoso, we've got 150 on-premises servers. They need more capacity. We want to minimize our costs and give our developers more productivity. Should we do a private hybrid cloud? Should we buy new servers? Or should we migrate? I'm kind of stepping through this a little quickly in the interest of time, but we would establish a hybrid in order to take advantage of our on-premises environment as well as give our developers the flexibility that they need. Okay, so one more slide. What we're going to do now is transition into session two in which we're moving wholly into core Azure services. We've done availability in regions, so it's time for us to get into the Azure portal, do resource groups, VM, storage, and SQL. Thanks for your participation. I'll see you in session two.